Hello, my name is Mrs. Claudia Thompson, and I am a Client Relationship Officer and Pension Administrator with CFAL, and I will be hosting this episode titled, The CFAL Blue Marlin Retirement Plan. In this continuation of our Blue Marlin Retirement Plan series, I am joined in studio with our experts, Mr. Richard Pinder, Operations Supervisor at CFAL, and Mr. Nathaniel Butler of Juber Solutions. Mr. Butler is an entrepreneur and one of our CFAL Blue Marlin Pension Plan clients who will bring a unique client perspective to the discussion. Welcome, Richard and Nathaniel. But first, allow me to properly introduce Nathaniel Butler to our audience. Mr. Nathaniel Butler is a certified financial planner, a financial coach, tax consultant, venture capitalist, and business development advisor. With 13 plus years experience in the financial services industry in various capacities such as estate planning, insurance agent, investment advisor, corporate services administrator, and former tax officer, over the years he has enriched the financial health of individuals by providing results, direction, and hope. Mr. Butler is the founder of Juber Solutions, a company whose mission is becoming the leading financial literacy education firm and financial planning service provider in the Caribbean by facilitating financial health and life education to everyone in every walk of life and their loved ones. Currently, Mr. Butler is the Executive Director of Creative Wealth Bahamas and the former Business Development Advisor with the Small Business Development Center. He has worked with a multitude of government branches, organizations, churches, and corporate businesses alike. He is married to the lovely Ashley Butler, and they are proud parents of a handsome son named Andreas Nathan Butler. During his time off, he loves to travel, exercise, celebrate life's milestones and accomplishments with his loving family. Welcome, Nathaniel, and welcome, Richard. So we have quite a few questions for you today. We know that you're a client of our CFAL Blue Marlin Retirement Plan. So we're going to ask you a few questions. I'm joined in studio also with Mr. Richard Pinder, our operations supervisor, who's going to be joining me and speaking with Mr. Butler today. So the first question I have for you is, what made you decide to open a CFAL Blue Marlin retirement plan? Oh, really great question. So for me, um, I was w- where I was working at at the time when I had opened up the fund, we did not offer pension plans to most of the staff. So I already was at a disadvantage. And considering the fact that CFAL is the leading provider in retirement, it only made sense to um, have the conversation. Um, After they would have provided me with some information about the product line, the Blue Marlin Fund just was just a perfect fit. It was just a perfect fit. Um, The one challenge I had was the fact that I wish when I had finished school, finished college and started working, um, I got that information because I could have started then. And I would have been in a better position today. It took some years. In addition to that, it also took me to be in a position where I didn't have a pension to understand the importance of possibly for those who are millennials or younger, to possibly take out a personal pension plan for yourself because chances are you're going to probably have more than one job at various different companies within the span of your career. That's very, very true. And do you remember which investment strategy you chose? Oh, yeah, definitely. So for me, most the investment strategy for retirement for me was a decision of going more conservative to more moderate. And the purpose for that is, by nature, I love um, investment opportunities that are that yield high and could be pretty risky. But when it com- comes down to uh, retirement, for the most part, that's one risk I was not willing to take. I needed to, some surety. Um, in addition to that, I also needed um, a company that has options outside of the country as well. So we weren't just looking at our traditional companies here, but also um, a mixture of also other products outside of the country as well. And so for me, I would say I'm, I'm grateful that the plan meets my retirement needs in the sense of being um, more along the lines of between, I would say, conservative to moderate in that sense. 
Okay, so on that same note, you kind of spoke a little bit about why you chose that strategy and, and how do you look at taking risk and so forth. So speak a little bit more about that because you talked about high yielding securities. You talked about being a little moderate and kind of doing a little a balance between both of them. So why so expand a little bit more on why you why you feel that that's the best option. So for me, when I look at investments, um, I put most investments into five categories. Uh, you have from real estate investment, um, you have securities, you have micro private equity, which I love. Um, you also have intellectual property. And last but not least, you also have the digital assets. And all, I guess, investment vehicles can fall in one of those five categories. Uh, for me, I love real estate. I love micro private equity. Securities is somewhere in between. And then last but not least, you have the intellectual property. I haven't made up my mind yet on the digital asset space. I'm still waiting. Um, but I'll say this. In all of the investments areas that I would have mentioned, they all have risks. They all have return. Um, what is so lovely living in the Bahamas, for real estate that is, we have several markets. We have the commercial land. We also have the um, local and where we rent to the locals or residents here. But more importantly, we also have the, the market of tourists or who, used, who come down for just a short stay. So you, we have the opportunity to rent to them. And though that brings consistent returns, um, to me, I felt that that was not enough to be a retirement plan per se. So it, it forced me to look at, okay, do I want to buy a bunch of stocks and call that a plan? Do I want to invest in a few mutual funds, call that a plan? Or last but not least, my, my favorite micro, micro private equity. But what happens if that business fails? What happens if those stocks, depending on the economy, that company fails or that company has to be bought out? Um, do I have the expertise to make the necessary moves in the market? All of these things I kind of ask myself. And even though I was in financial services, believe it or not, and I'm not ashamed to say it, I did not have full knowledge about investments. I had knowledge on the other areas, but not investments. And so, um, like I said, it led me to say, okay, who's number one in the space? Okay, C file, let's go there. What products you guys have? Okay, give me the breakdown about the products. What makes these products different? Um, what happens if the, uh, the, the, the economy goes into the toilet? What would you guys do? What happens if it's a boom? What will I receive? And after talking to the rep, and she was able to provide such, not even just great answers, but she was able to point to great examples. And that provided me the confidence to say, you know what, this meets my need because I'm looking down the road and I'm looking at some of the risky investments I'm going to be making. And I want to be able to say, regardless of what I'm able to do in my, when I have my youth, my, my energy, um, I can retire. I, I can't retire. And that's the biggest thing. And one of the greatest fears in working and talking to so many persons, I realize a lot of persons in this country cannot afford to retire. Right, absolutely. And that's something that we look at at CFAL as well. So based on based on that 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 conversation we're having just now, are you happy overall with the returns? Oh of course, man. I I guess like I said, the only regret I had was I wish that I had come into the information a little bit sooner. You know, because when you're dealing with investments, the time game. The, the, you know, the younger you are, the better off you will be. Yes. Overall, absolutely. So it sounds like you're a risk taker in your everyday investing, but not with your retirement funds. Is that fair? Yeah, that's a fair statement. <laughs> that is extremely fair statement. To sum it all up, yes. <laughs> so you want to make sure those funds are there. So that leads into my next question. Has this given you any type of peace of mind, knowing that you have something set aside for retirement? I'll t I'll, to be honest with you, yes. But... You know what gives me even more of a peace of mind? When I look at the strategies of families and friends, what they're doing. For some of them, they rely on national insurance, which is our, our social security system. And, you know, I'm going to be a little biased here. National insurance is great 
as a supplemental income, but it's not great as a primary income going into retirement. That's just the facts. Mm -hmm. And then in addition to that, when you look at um, what you're going to get back from NIB, a lot of persons have not even met the criteria to receive a pension from NIB. You know, I can't tell you how many persons will wait until retirement to discover whether or not they have met the criteria to get it. This pandemic has taught a lot of employees that their employer are not up to date with payments to their contribution, which um, is sad that the pandemic happened, but it's good for them to have that reality check now so that they can avoid a, a retirement um, collapse when it's time for them to retire. And then secondly, when you look at um, what many of them, I guess, the concepts that they have about retirement, some some of them want to retire a little bit earlier, others want to retire with the probably like the real estate investments that they have. And, and all of that is fine and dandy, but here's the factor that we don't take into consideration. What happens if you get sick? What happened in your later years, um, you still have a child in school. Your expenses basically almost stay the same, but it gradually increases just simply due to inflation. But your income, for the most part, does not. In some cases, it could be even reduced to one third. So to say, do you have peace in mind having one third and your income is still the same? And that scares me. That keeps me up at night because when I look at so many family and friends, they cannot retire. They just cannot. And as much as you try to help them, um, you know, we are a society that is very extended family oriented, but we are also a society, a country that is listed as one of the top 10 most expensive destinations in the world to live in. And so just, just, you know, looking at it from just an outlook perspective, if you don't put in the work for your own retirement, nobody can really afford to help you in retirement. I'm just, I'm just yeah. speaking blindly. And last but not least, we also have to deal with this misconcept of retirement is all about having children. My pension baby and... <laughs> I, mean, you, I think that's part of our baby culture, isn't it? Not? When you get older, yes, exactly. you're gonna take care, take care of your, right. take care yes. of your mommy, take care of your mommy, or take I care of your daddy. Pension baby, as they call it. Yeah, the yes. pension baby. Yes. But you know, what is so sad, and what is the greatest challenge I see here, is the fact that because we don't really practice, preach, share passing acquiring assets and passing it down the line to the next generation is almost like a race where we all have to run that race for ourselves acquiring assets and having to go through somewhat of a financial struggle ourselves and it could have been a lot easier if certain items are passed down we don't have to wait until somebody passes on or expires we can give it to them as they are coming up I'm not saying give everyone hand out. What I am saying is just make it a little bit more easier for the generation coming behind. And I think that will help so many of us out. But for right now, yes, I am experiencing a peace of mind. <laughs> so do you think that there could be a shift in that mindset from a pension baby to, hey, I'm going to give my child something to help them on the asset ladder? Yeah, yeah definitely. Based, especially based on how the generations are, are, are learning more and, and understanding how important it is to have that base. I agree. So so let's let's look back. So 10 years ago, Seaval has been celebrating, what, 20 years? 20 years of, of dominance, yeah. I would say? I think it's 23 years <laughs> 23 now. Years. Yeah. Okay, 23 yeah. years now. So let's go look back 10 years ago. Um, 10 years ago, most of the conversations that you guys probably would have had is with bigger companies who could afford a pension plan and you would probably be invited in to talk to retirees or those who are about to retire or top managers per se, middle managers, top managers, right? Today, the millennial category for you guys have increased exponentially. 
Um, then you have the Generation Z. They're also asking some questions how they can make some money moves as well now. In a very different way than and, the Generation Z. Yeah, because before. they're watching their parents yes. and grandparents. Uh-huh. Right? And they're all saying, hey, I do not want that, that. desire mm-hmm. lifestyle. Right. Right. I That's want exactly to change it. my lifestyle. Now, here lies the issue in that. The, the whole mindset and the whole mentality of the pension baby, that still exists. That still exists by the generation, the baby boomers, who felt the hard brunt of it. Remember now, when these, the, gener- the baby boomers, when they were coming out of school, many of them had to take half their salary and give it to their parents yes, to, to help out families. all of Absolutely. the other siblings who were coming behind Absolutely. them. Yes. And so now that they have retired, they're now looking down the line and say, boy, I can put this one through school. And when he or she is finished, they can take care of me. Well, here lies the new challenge today. One, school fee today in college <laughs> is extremely expensive. So even though we're talking about retirement, I would also advise if you're listening to this and you do not have a college savings, I think you need to reach out to CFAL as well to have that conversation as well. Because scholarships are good. Them working is good. But if it's you could have some savings as Absolutely. well to contribute to that bill, it will be even better. So school fees are not the same. Let's start there. Secondly, who's to say that that child is coming back from Canada, from the United States, from the UK to live here in the Bahamas to take care of you? Right. That's a whole other conversation. That's a whole, yeah, because <laughs> yeah, now there's so, right, that's a whole other <laughs> there's so much <laughs> lack of opportunity right. um, here yes. presented. And yeah. last but not least, we cannot not talk about the, the, the fact that some persons may continue their lives. I know so many persons who quickly get married, who may have a child, who get into a career, who sends them another part of the world. So they're not looking back. Some don't even have the mentality that I should pay my parents back. So now you leave the baby boomer conflicted. Oh, what I have done for these children. But... We never had financial conversations inside the home so that our expectations are all aligned. Mommy's going to do this. Daddy's going to do this. this The child is going to do this. This is what is expected of the child. So do we see the shift? The shift is happening. Are we prepared for the shift? I don't think so. Can we do more? We are doing more. Conversations like this, being in various different forms, making them aware of what they're faced with now, what they're about to face, and what they can do, I think that is what needs to be echoed a little bit more into some other communities that do not search for the information before the time. They wait until they're in the crisis to try and get the antidote. And sometimes when you're dealing with financial products, that may not be the best solution or the best way to get help. But I'll say this, though. The good news is, with this generation, millennials, the uh, Generation X, and also Generation Z, all of them are a little bit more proactive. They're proactive in the sense to say, I have an idea what my desired lifestyle should look like, and I'm going to do everything in my power to attain and also to achieve that. So in your experience, do you think that or maybe you can use yourself as an example. Did you learn about finance in the home and from family members or from education in the workplace? I'm just curious. I'm going to be really transparent with you guys. And I'm going to say some things that is going to be almost like a bombshell inside here. So in regards to being taught at home, no. In regards to being taught in school, no. I would even go as far as saying I've, I've as mentioned before, in the beginning of the broadcast, I've spent now almost close to 15 years in financial services, and I have not received a formal training in the area of personal finances. Let me repeat that. I have not received a, a, a formal training in personal finances for myself, that is. Um, I've worked in the field in insurance, in estate planning, in corporate services, in taxation, the person to my left and the person to my right, in those various different companies, small and big, I discovered that outside of the very tasks that we do or the products that we sell, there was gross ignorance in all of the other areas of personal finances. 
And that's across the board. That's not limited to the companies that I work in. That just speaks to society, the world. And this is not only a problem here in the Bahamas. This is a problem in most countries around the world. There is no formal training in most of our schools, in most of our homes, even in some of our civic and social organizations. Now, today, it has changed a little bit. There's a little bit more conversation about it. Can I say, is it the conversation to the level of a formal program? Still no. Because you could have a conversation and say, you should save, you should budget. But we're dealing with a group of people who still don't know what to do in regards to a budget. They have a, saw somebody put a budget together. So to tell them to budget, you know, you're just adding to their frustration because they don't know how to, to do that. It's almost like telling somebody who can't cook, you should prep. Well, where do I start? Where do I start? Right. What should I get? Right. You know what I mean? So from that standpoint, I think that, and I'm just being very vocal about it, you know, I decided, you know what, I'm going to be a part of the solution and I'm going to be a part of the change. And so I went out and I got a number of certifications, a number of certificates in the area of finances, in the area of personal finances. And even in all of that, in all of my training, what still shocks me is the fact that a good portion of it is about products, a good portion of it is about theory, but a good portion of it is about sales. And I'll be honest with you, most of my colleagues in the space have been received more sales training than they have received training in regards to knowledge about the product line or the products or how to even use the products. So now when you look at those who we should go to for advice, you know, you almost have to qualify them because in a lot of cases, they're only putting out what they've been taught in sales class. That's an interesting point. That's they can't even connect the dots in regards to financial planning. It's almost like everybody will get literally the same solution who walks through the door, even though our circumstances are not the same at all. And so to your point, no, I've not received that, that training. However, uh, with, the, with the help of, of persons like uh, Mr. Richard Pinder and others reaching out to so many of the experts in the space, we were able to come together and put a formal program together for others so that they can be touched, that they can be empowered. But you know what was the number one criticism when we did that? The number one criticism has always been this. Where were you 10, 15, 20 <laughs> years ago when I was coming up? And I'm like, well, we were none the wiser, but we're doing something right, right now. Right. And they say the that. They the say future. that because of the mistakes that they made. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. say that because of the bad decisions that they made. Remember now, the form of education that most persons are, are operating out of is through trial and error. Many persons are not reading. And even if you read some of the great classics of all time, um, like a rich dad, poor dad, like a think and grow rich, honestly, that only helps shape the mindset. It does not give you a practical a step, strategy, step by step, step, right. by step what right. you should be doing today. Because they're based on different markets. I, and let, let's talk about that. And how can you apply... Um, uh, a, a, a fishing strategy that works in, 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 in the North Pole here in a tropical climate would ca um, cater to a different group of fish. You understand what I'm saying? So I agree with that. The different, they're, they're speaking to a different market where there's, grow there's so much opportunity here in this country. Oh, man, the opportunity, um, even just recognizing that there is a possible opportunity, that knowledge is absent. That it's not saying that it doesn't exist. It's just absent from many of the environments that we all transition through. So I see that you're a CFP, a certified financial planner. So talk a little bit about that for me, please, because I know you've done some training. And so you're formally, you know, trained. You can help others with financial planning. What was the process like? So when I got my um, CFP uh, designation, uh, what was so interesting about that experience was the fact that from day one inside the class, I'm saying to my lecturers, hey, I'm going to get this designation and I want to share most of the material that is in this class to the rest of the country. And many of them, they, they encouraged me. 
But one of the things that the CFP license taught me was that, and what I needed especially, is that even though we have financial services as an industry, there's so many sub-industries. We had to learn from insurance through investment, estate planning, the list goes on trust. And we went through so many different topics and subtopics and areas. It made me aware that even though the course was great, I still needed to do some additional reading and studying. But more importantly, I needed to be amongst the practitioners to hear the scenarios and stories, see how they apply a lot of information that I got from the class. The great news about it is that most of the lecturers practice a lot of the material that they shared. And I'm so grateful for that because they give us real life example within this market. So the CFP um, designation, the course was a blessing for me. And I'm hoping that um, we'll have many more courses like that. Um, I'm hoping that um, we can have also a CFP society soon that will take the mantle up in making sure that uh, financial literacy, for the most part, is is championed here in this society as well. So when did you get interested in finance? Were you in school? Were you in college? Were you trying to buy a home? Like, What was the trigger for you? Because it's always different for different people you know, this origin story. <laughs> Boy, listen to me. You know, it's crazy to think about it. When I look back, my background, my degree is actually in human resource management and organizational development. So I was so far from finance. It is it's so funny. And at the time when I got my degree, um, believe it or not, HR is one of those areas where there's not a lot of movement. You know, most companies will hold on to the HR officer for years until they retire and then replace them with someone younger, you know. So there wasn't a whole lot of opportunity in HR. So I kind of flowed around in operations for a bit before I got into financial services. And when I got into financial services, um, well, actually, let me, let me take you further back. The story actually started with my mother. My mother... Um, and, and she's with me today. She's my biggest champion. Uh, my mother had to retire 10 years before her retirement age. So imagine now you go to the doctor. The doctor lets you know that you have this medical condition. And in order for you to live a, a life where your health is somewhat intact and see at that time there, were, there weren't any grandchildren, to see your grandkids, you would need to retire. Now you have to kind of stomach that information. You have to digest that information. Now you have to go home and tell your family, um, based on talking to the medical practitioner, I now need to leave the job. And when you leave the job, you don't get your pension money right away. We now have to wait 10 years before you even have access to that pension money. And because of your medical condition, you can't really work a nine to five job. So now we've gone from a two income home to one. My lifestyle, the lifestyle of my siblings drastically change overnight. So the reality or the concept of money uh, steep in very, very quickly. But here lies the challenge. So there were two major challenges that I experienced. And I can't... To our listeners, tune in next week for another episode of our podcast series. For 23 years, CFAL has offered a flexible approach to pension management. No matter where life takes you, your Blue Marlin retirement plan can always be there. Your contributions will continue to be invested to provide you with security when you retire. Thank you, our audience, for listening. We at CFAL hope that you and yours are keeping safe and adhering to all of the COVID-19 safety protocols. Please do subscribe to the CFAL Talks podcast on Google or Apple for more thought-provoking discussions on important issues affecting the Bahamian economy. You can also join us every Monday evening right here at 6.30 on Guardian Radio. The CFAL Talks podcast would love to hear from you, our listeners, on what financial topics you would like to hear our experts discuss. Please send your suggestions to info at cfal.com or post on our Facebook page or on our website, cfal.com. Thank you again for listening.